Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining uh, our webinar. It's the episode 17 of Warsaw Quantum Computing Group. Uh, and today, Dr. Jakub Milczarek from uh, Jagiellonian University from Kraków will tell us about quantum simulations of quantum gravity. So, Jakub, uh, the floor or the Zoom is yours. And let's just share your screen. Thank you, Pavel, for, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me for uh, the, the webinar. So let me let me share my, my screen right now. Uh, you cannot start screen share while the other participants... Oh, okay. So I will, okay. Just, I will just stop. stop sharing. I'll just stop sharing my screen. So you can now start sharing yours. Yes, we can see your screen now. So do, do you see the slides? Yes, yes, I can see it. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a program, a research program that we initiated something like uh, two and a half years ago uh, in my group Quantum Cosmos Lab at the Eglin University in Krakow. And uh, the, 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 the program, the research project, is about the quantum simulations uh, of quantum gravity. Actually, we are, we are the guys working on uh, quantum gravity since a while. And uh, uh, we, we started looking towards quantum computing, I mean, over the last years, and uh, with the aim to apply quantum computing to make some progress in our research. And uh, our uh, ultimate goal is to use quantum computers uh, to, uh, to simulate quantum gravity. And we, we, we did first attempts towards this direction. And uh, so during the talk, uh, I will present some of our recent results. Um, basically, I will start with the, with the results from my 2018 papers and uh, then I will pass to uh, our recent papers written with a PhD student of mine, Grzegorz Czelusta. And uh, that would be, the, 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 I would say, the core of the results. But let me start with, uh, with the motivation and uh, some uh, contemplation concerning where we can apply quantum computing, uh, I would say the near-term quantum computing. So by this, I mean the quantum computing within this decade. So uh, we know that, uh, that, that quantum technologies are around, okay? And, and especially we are interested in, uh, in quantum computing technologies, but we, we know that the quantum computing technologies are still very, uh, in a very premature stage. And, uh, but, but there are already some first, um, uh, branches some some first areas in which we can try to uh, apply the quantum quantum computing and and from my perspective as a basic research a guy uh, a theoretical physicist uh, we see some first emerging perspective in, in basic research and uh, this is basically what I'm going to to discuss today so let me briefly summarize some of them. So, uh, so the first thing is that we, the quantum computing is not more than doing quantum information um, experimentally. So this, this really gives us a, a, a tool to explore quantum information itself. And, and the basic properties of quantum information, also the, the decoherence of the interaction of the quantum state with an, an environment, etc. So this is something what we can already learn uh, by playing with uh, um, current quantum computers. Also, there is a quantum chemistry, uh, which is um, a, a domain in which uh, I would say that the near-term quantum computers might be applied successfully. Another domain uh, pretty related uh, to, to quantum chemistry is uh, simulation of uh, physical systems to which actually this quantum chemistry uh, systems belong. And within this domain, 
uh, I could um, divide into two, I mean, subsets. Uh, and the one concerned the condensed matter systems, like uh, spin systems, uh, which are a uh, description of the different state of matter. And another domain concerns fundamental physics. And uh, within the fundamental physics, um, especially we are interested in quantum field theories, which are um, our tools to describe the basic properties of, uh, of, uh, of matter and interactions. And uh, another domain is, uh, is quantum gravity. And today I'm gonna focus on quantum gravity, which is uh, an attempt to capture the quantum properties of gravity. Another uh, domain within the basic research is a mathematics, and, and there's a lot of possibilities concerning the, the mathematical uh, basic analysis, which can be performed with a quantum computing um, for instance, you can consider solvability issues for certain logical formulas, which can be done using um, Grover search algorithm, for instance. So there's a plenty of possible applications concerning basic mathematics. So I'm, I'm emphasizing this possibilities because, I mean, in the early stage of technologies, actually, the first uh, application might be in, 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 in basic research, and the basic research is, might serve as a, as, as, as a catalyzer of the development of this quantum technologies. Of course, we can also consider a more direct, I mean, everyday life application, but I'm not going to talk about them today. Uh, but um, just to summarize some of them, there's a lot of optimization possibilities. There is uh, certified quantum ra randomness. By the way, this is also a thing that we are exploring at my group in Krakow. There is also quantum machine learning, a subject of interest of quantum wars of group, especially. So uh, perhaps not all of you know what uh, the quantum gravity is, uh, the quantum gravity is basically a search for, uh, for a fundamental description of the gravity, um, taking into account the quantum properties, because we assume here that the quantum mechanics is, is a right um, theory to describe gravity, okay? Uh, but under this assumption, we expect that there is some merge bet between the quantum theory and the gravitation described by, I mean, classically by general relativity, and also, I mean, the, the concept of relativity, which uh, merges a space and time. So if you take the three characteristic uh, constants of the three theories, I mean, of the quantum theory, the gravity and relativity, then by dimensional analysis, you can end up with a certain uh, scales, the so-called Planck scales. And I, uh, I, I just wrote here two of them, the Planck length and the Planck time. And the Planck length, if you do uh, the calculation, gives you roughly 10 to the minus 35 meter. This is extremely low, uh, extremely tiny scale. Uh, which is basically impossible to probe experimentally with the current, uh, even more advanced experiments. Of course, there are some possibilities to put some constraint using astrophysics and cosmologists. Actually, this is something what we have been working on for a long time, but this is extremely difficult. So, uh, so basically, you can think about the picture uh, of, of, of the space-time at a very deep Planck scale being as some sort of discrete structure below which you have no actually motivation to talk about a space and time itself. And there is a lot of war. I mean, this is basically a hundred years of, of, of different attempts to, to, to describe quantum properties of gravity. And there is a lot of you know, a lot of models, a lot of attempts, and, and, and etc. So here I'm gonna focus on 
on, on one of the leading approaches uh, called loop quantum gravity, but you have to keep in mind that there are also some others and there are some relations between them. I, I'm not going to go into the details. Uh, the loop quantum gravity approach is uh, roughly 30 years old approach. Uh, it has been initiated by Abayash Tekar, Karol Orvelli, and Lee Smolin. And uh, you can find a lot of uh, fascinating books about loop quantum gravity, both, uh, uh, you know, monographs, but also there is a bunch of the popular books, especially by Karol Orvelli and Lee Smolin and Martin Boyevold, which I strongly recommend to you. To read. And the, the basic mm, thing about loop quantum gravity approach is that it's, it's a re relational approach in a sense that it describes, it's, it's captured uh, a relation between, I would say, the chunks of space. And uh, from the mathematical side, uh, this relational property is, uh, is captured in the structure of something what we call the spin network. And uh, the spin networks are, are graphs, okay, so we have links and we have nodes. And these graphs represent different configurations of space in a sense that with every, um, in every node of the graph, we can associate a chunk of space, an atom of space. There, this is very precisely mathematically formulated. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to, to, to overview, I mean, in a few words, the, the essence of this. Everything is very well defined mathematically, but, but, but the basic physics, basic idea behind this is that you have the atom of space at the nodes, and the links tell you whether two atoms of space are neighbors or not. So if we have this node and that node, we know that these two nodes are neighbors because there is a link between them. But on the other hand, you can do everything what you want with this graph, you can modify it, uh, but without changing actually the, 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 the state of gravity, okay? This, this means that you can deform the graph, but you don't change the state in the sense that two atoms of space will remain neighbors. But behind, I mean, on the top of this graph, something what, what makes this a spin network instead of just a graph is that we associate a spin labels with the links. The spin labels are based, I mean, from the mathematical side, are uh, different in irreducible representation of SU2 group. So zero, one half, one, three half. So these are different spins, okay? And what is in, in, important is that these spins which are associated with, with all the links meet at the nodes and they have to be added in a, uh, uh, in a given way such that they sum up to zero. This is, I mean, this is related with the so-called Gauss constraint. I will tell you a little bit more about this in a second. But before I go to that, let me explain a little bit about the links, okay? The, the links of the, of the graph are associated with so-called colonomies. Um, the colonomies are, I mean, the, the different name for the colonomies are power transport. So basically what you think, uh, you, you have a line, okay, it's, it's uh, depicted here. This is, a, this is a curve. And then at the two endpoints of the curve, you have two Hilbert spaces. And then basically what the, what the colonomy is doing is mapping a Hilbert space at one endpoint, the so-called source, with a, uh, with a state in the Hilbert space 
at the target, okay? So the colonomy from the quantum me mechanical perspective is a map, is a unitary map, moreover, between two Hilbert spaces. And depending on whether you have a spin one half or higher representation of the SU2 group, you will have a map between the Hilbert spaces of a different dimension. So in case you have a spin one half representation, so the so-called fundamental representation of SU2 group, you are mapping between the two qubit Hilbert spaces, so between the two two-dimensional Hilbert spaces. In general, if you have a higher order representation, you map between two J plus one dimensional Hilbert spaces um, in such case. Here in my talk, uh, I, I'm gonna focus mostly on the fundamental representation uh, for simplicity actually. But you have to keep in mind that in general, we can go be, be, be beyond that. So the link, let me, uh, let me repeat, is, is a map between the two Hilbert spaces. And then let us focus on one note, okay? One four valent note, which is a, a special case. So it means that if four links meet at this node, so this means that four Hilbert spaces meet at the node, okay? And then, as I, as I, as, as I mentioned, the so-called Gauss constraint implies that we have to sum up the spin to zero, okay? So in other words, we are looking for singlets, okay? So let's say that we have four spin one half particles. So then the spin networks are constructed such that they satisfy uh, a certain condition which gives a singlet state at the node. This is something very fundamental. This is related with the Gauss constraint. And the Gauss constraint uh, is, I mean, physically uh, related with, with something that you perhaps know if you, if you, if you learn a quant if you learn classical electrodynamics with the, with the Gauss law. A Gauss law tells you that if you have a certain charge in a point, then the divergence of the electric field is proportional to this charge. But if you have no charge, the divergence is zero. So this Gauss constraint is like a discrete version of, of the Gauss law. It's something very fundamental. And this Gauss law has uh, a beautiful geometric interpretation. Namely, it's a, it's a sum of the vectors which are normal to the phases of the tetrahedra such that they sum to zero and they actually define the tetrahedra. So with every node, you can associate uniquely a dual geometric description, which is, which is a tetrahedra, defined such that the area of a given phase is given uh, by the spin label of a link which crosses the phase, and this area is given by this formula. So, so this is something which has been uh, derived in loop quantum gravity already in, in the mid 90s, okay? So this is something very well established in loop quantum gravity. And uh, based on such building blocks, you can try to construct more complex uh, configurations. And so I would say that the simplest next step would be to just to glue together two nodes, okay? So this is a, a simple spin network state, a graph with the two nodes, 
the so-called dipole configuration. And the dipole configuration and the ge geometrically is represented by, by two tetrahedra, which are glued together face by face. Okay, and this is the information uh, encoded in the links. Okay. So this is something what we know, okay? And uh, we can play with this in a very abstract way. But then eventually we would like to extract physics from this. And uh, moreover, we would like to uh, use this fundamental building blocks to reconstruct uh, classical space-time. However, the problem is that we know how to describe uh, a single node of the spin network. We know how to describe certain simplified configurations of the spin networks, like uh, the so-called content states. And this content states, very homogeneous configurations are used, especially in, in quantum cosmology to describe the evolution of the universe. However, in general, we would like to have an access to inhomogeneous configurations, okay? And this is very, very complicated thing. And we have basically no knowledge about what's happening with the spin networks for such highly inhomogeneous configurations, okay? And uh, the attempt to to address this uh, this problem is uh, our many body quantum simulations. I mean, this is this is uh, you will see in a second. This is this is very quantum. Uh, mm, this is very quantum physical system with a huge number of degrees of freedom and the natural um, natural path. To, 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 to describe such physics is, uh, is, is by many body quantum simulations, okay? And actually, a sort of many body quantum simulations in the context of uh, gravity is, um, is a subject of uh, very intense uh, studies within another a uh, competitive approach to quantum gravity, so-called causal dynamical triangulations, and actually uh, the leading uh, group of causal dynamical triangulations is, uh, is, based, is in, in my department, and uh, we are doing here the most advanced uh, computer simulations of, uh, of a quantum universe in a causal dynamical triangulations. Uh, actually on the supercomputers uh, on my floor here in this institute. However, this, this approach is based on a path integrals, the Feynman integrals. And uh, the Feynman integrals can be, perhaps you know, uh, related to statistical physics. And uh, then you can explore the quantum fluctuations uh, around the classical trajectories uh, by applying Monte Carlo computer simulations, uh, which are uh, extremely time consuming mm, and uh, require a lot of memory to store the, the configurations. However, you can do some progress. Uh, however, the, the problem, I mean, the, the attempt, the, the path um, employing the family integrals does not allow you to uh, have a full control over the quantum state, okay? So this is, this is some attempt. Uh, I, my colleagues simulate this kind of uh, quantum universes containing hundreds of thousands of building blocks, and they observe a different states of such um, quantum space-time, and there's a lot of very interesting results. However, there are some limitations, as I, as, as, as I emphasized. So in, in general, we would like to have a full control of the quantum state. However, this is, 
this is difficult. This is difficult because of the huge dimensionality of the quant of the Hilbert space. So if you take a if you take a qubit, the simplest non-trivial quantum state uh, to a dimensional one, uh, you know that uh, the dimensionality is two. Uh, which is generalization of the classical bit from which the, the name qubit is, is coming from. However, if you consider uh, a system of n qubits, then the state of such a composite system lives in a Hilbert space, which is a tensor product of n copies of the Hilbert space. And we know that the dimensional of the tensor product is exponential function of two in that case, okay? So the dimensionality grows exponentially fast. So already if you take, let's say the 40 qubits, your dimension is 10 to the 12, is be, becoming very, very uh, significant even for such a small number. So, so going towards 100 is already becoming impossible with classical uh, supercomputers, okay? So there is no other possibility here to, to, to go to make a progress uh, than just using quantum computers, okay? which uh, allows us to play directly with the quantum systems and not by simulating the quantum systems on classical computers. And we know that uh, there has been uh, a significant progress made over the, over the last years in uh, quantum computing technologies, especially uh, based on uh, supercomputing circuit, su superconducting circuits, and um, quantum processors with few and dozens of uh, still very noisy qubits are uh, are made uh, available online, and we can do some tests. We can we can play with this, and moreover, there are some emulators available. We can also run our own emulators, quantum computers for the purpose of making tests. So there is uh, a door open to start using um, quantum computers, at least for the purpose of tests and to, to verify whether uh, the future quantum computers might be applied successfully uh, to help us with, with the problems that we have. And uh, before I go to the details, uh, how we do that, how our approach looks like, let me emphasize one thing, namely concerning the quantum simulations of Planck scale physics, uh, what we are doing here, I mean, philosophically, basically, is a sort of exact simulation. Actually, this is a term which has been introduced in uh, in mid 80s in uh, Feynman's seminal paper on, simula on, on, on quantum computing and using quantum computers which uh, didn't exist at that time but he hypothesized that the quantum computers could be used to perform simulations of quantum system in a sense that let's say that we have the Planck scale system with a certain degrees of freedom but described by the, the, the standard quantum mechanics. And then we do a simulation in a sense that we have completely different physical system from the viewpoint of realization. Uh, so this might be, let's say, the supercomputing circuits. But from the viewpoint of mathematics, from the viewpoint of um, quantum mechanics, it's precisely the same, okay? So we do quantum experiment and we are 
just uh, starting one to one uh, with the, a system which is one to one with the original one. The difference is that this is a different physical realization in the sense that you have different physical realization of Carmonicus later. Okay, you might have um, you might have um, uh, um, uh, electromagnetic qu quantized wave, which is uh, which is a model for electromagnetic wave, which is a model of uh, Carmonicus later. You can have uh, a quantized LC circuit, which is another physical representation of um, of Carmonicus uh, latent. You can have a mechanical but quantum pendulum, which is another physical representation of the same uh, quantum mechanical system. But here the difference is that because we use a different physical realization, we can do experiments, okay? We can perform measurements on the degrees of freedom. And this is something what is impossible to do with the original degrees of freedom, which are at the Planck scale and which are inaccessible with the resolution of the experiments that we have. So this is, this is, I would say, the, 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 the philosophy behind this approach. So having this in mind, let me proceed to, to the details. So I'm going to focus on, on a building block of our quantum space-time, or more, um, to, to be more precise, the, the, the space the space at this level, I will, I will pass to the space I mean, uh, and in the last slides of my talk, for the moment let's just try to describe a quantum space which is uh, you know, emerging from uh, our understanding of Planck scale physics given by loop quantum gravity. So we have a node and let us consider the links which are associated with the fundamental representations um, of SU2 group. So the spin one, spin one half. We know that when, you, when we uh, uh, merge four spins one half, so in other, uh, math mathematically, we do uh, a tensor product over four Hilbert spaces each of spin one half, we can decompose it into a direct sum, okay, of a different spins. So we can build a spin two, we can build a spin one, we can also build a spin zero. And it turns out that we have two different possibilities to, uh, to, to, to combine uh, four spin one halves such they, that they sum up to zero. So it means that we have two different uh, singlets, okay? And these two different singlets will span an internal Hilbert space of the node. This is something what we call intertwiner space, okay? So the intertwiner space is something what is a space of singlets at the node. In, here in this case, it's two-dimensional, so it's, it can naturally be associated with a qubit, okay? And we call it intertwiner qubit. So in that case, um, our spin network composed of such a four valent nodes will be a system of, of qubits, okay? And the spin network state will be a tensor product of of, of such qubits. So, uh, so the general state of such an intertwiner qubit can be written as, uh, um, as a superposition, a general superposition of the two singlets. I call the singlets 0s and 1s. And actually, these two singlets for four 
spin one half particles can be constructed using the singlet and triplet states for uh, the pars of spin one half particles. This is something what you should know. So, so this is a singlet for two spin one half particles. So, so this is a spin zero. And so the one possibility to, to, to get a singlet is just to, this can be written here, this can be seen here. You take two spins and create two singlets, two pairs of sing, two singlets, and then you tensor product them. Okay, this is one possibility. Another possibility is a bit more complicated and can be done using the triplet states for two spin one half particles. This is uh, important to note that uh, with the with the with the, with the node of the uh, of, of the uh, spin network, we can associate the the tetrahedra as I mentioned. And actually, the volume of that tetrahedra uh, is given by the eigenvalues of the volume operator that we can introduce in loop quantum gravity. And the eigenstates to those uh, eigenvalues are certain superpositions of these two basis states. We will explore the superposition thereafter in the simulations, okay? But this is uh, just to keep in mind the relation to geometry. So now the task is, is that we would like to uh, build a quantum algorithm which gives us the tetrahedra, okay? Thereafter, of course, we would like to use such a circuit uh to i mean in a composition with the uh, with the other similar circuits to build a uh, more complex configuration but that from the viewpoint of quantum computing the basic step is to introduce a quantum circuit which is generating the intertwiner qubit state okay this is this is the first step and as we know, we build the intertwiner qubit state using four spin one half particles, so four, uh, four qubits. So we can expect that at least four uh, qubits and the quantum register are needed to produce that state. Of course, there might be some ancillary qubits in the, in the circuit especially if you want to take into account quantum error code corrections as well. But as you will see in the, in the simplest in the implementation, we just need four, four qubits for that purpose. So right now, the, the thing is that we would like to introduce that, that, that operator. Let me first slide, start with the, with a very simple situation in which we generate a singlet, uh, which is the zero S, one of the basis states uh, for the intertwiner qubit, which is just a product, tensor product, of two spin one half singlets. So these are basically the Bell states. And the Bell states can be, uh, can be generated very easily using quantum circuits. So just using the Pauli matrices and Hadamard matrix and the C node gates. So we just take the four, uh, four qubits in the, uh, in the zero state initially. And for the two pairs, you generate the Bell pairs and then you get the answer. So this is something. Very simple. And this is something what we start with in, in 2018. And we simulated that on the IBM quantum computer. 
a five qubit uh, quantum computer and the fidelity of the of the state that we get from the simulation was pretty low it was around 71 percent so the fidelity of the, the, the state the quality of the state was was very low okay so which which was because of the still very high uh, errors in the in the in the quantum computer that time so that was not very promising because even with a very simple state we had very poor quality of of uh, of the state that we get and even for a single node so uh, thinking about the more nodes uh, would have no sense at that time and then uh, we started to look for more general description of the intertwiner qubits so the task was to just to find a circuit which is not only generating one of the basis states, but is generating an arbitrary uh, intertwiner qubit state parametrized by the theta and phi angle on the block sphere. And if you use the definitions of the 0s and 1s expressed in this um, singlet and triplets for the spin one half particles, then you can rewrite the state in this form in a more symmetric form uh, with a certain coefficient this is something that you can uh, find in our paper and then i i'm i'm not going to go into the details how this uh, circus work because uh, time is running but the thing is that eventually what you can do is that you can introduce a quantum circuit is this circuit uh, which is generating an arbitrary intertwiner qubit state uh, with some u and v unitary matrices uh, with the coefficients c1 c2 c3 which are a function which are functions of the theta and phi uh, angles on the block sphere okay so here you have control node uh, control uh, node uh, c node uh, gates here and and anti control but you can also express them using c nodes so this is basically a circuit that we gonna investigate right now and uh, simulate on a quantum computer but for this purpose you have to keep in mind that the topology of quantum processors is uh, imposing a certain uh, limitations of what type of uh, circuits can be executed so therefore we have to perform the so-called transpilation of the quantum circuit such that it fits to the architecture of the quantum processor and we did the transpilation for IBM Yorktown five qubit quantum computer and IBM Melbourne quantum computer. So these these are the the circuits that we obtain after rearranging the gates such that they can be embedded in the architectures of the quantum computers. Okay. And then based on that, we perform simulations for six representative states on the block sphere. So uh, we use the, the basis states, 0s and 1s, but, but also uh, the separate positions that you get uh, by acting with the Hadamard matrix. And also these two uh v plus and v minus uh, states which are i mean from the viewpoint of the state of the photon are are, are related to the different less helicity states of a photon but in our case they are related with the two different eigen uh, volume eigen states v plus and v minus so 
here you can find the results of simulations uh, performed on both uh, Yorktown 5 qubit and the Melbourne 15 qubit quantum processors. And uh, in the simulations, we perform uh, for every state, we perform 10 computational rounds. And in every computational round, we, we made 1,024 shots, so 1,024 execution. And based on this 10 computational rounds, all the statistical properties like uh, standard deviations were derived. But to see better, uh, you know, that the, the quality of this uh, of the state, it's good to uh, consider fidelities. I mean, here we, 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 we play with the classical fidelity. We didn't perform a full tomography of the quantum state. Okay, so this is not a quantum fidelity that we consider here, but this is classical fidelity. So uh, these are the, the fidelities for the six states under consideration. And you can see that using the Yorktown, the five qubit uh, quantum computer, we get fidelities at the level of 90%, which is pretty good. So this is roughly 20% increase with respect to what we get in 2018. And uh, then, Using the Melbourne quantum computer, which uh, contains 15 qubits, we get 85, which is still fine and it's still better than what we get with the five qubit quantum computer uh, uh, two years uh, ago. So there is a progress. So this is this is pretty promising concerning the simulation of a single um, a single node. Of course, this is something what we can do in the fractions of second on uh, on uh, on a computer on on an iPhone okay so uh, this is nothing that we cannot do easily even on the piece of paper okay but this is just a proof of concept that we can apply quantum computing here and but this is this is still only a single node okay this is uh, still not enough this is not what we would like to eventually do and one of the things that we would like to do is is to um, evaluate certain transition amplitudes between the different states because the time is running uh, i'm not going to go into the details of that but uh, i'm i, I just want to emphasize that the gravitational system is is, uh, is very peculiar because it's, 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 a, it's, it's an example of a constrained system. And um, so it means that you start with some kinematical Hilbert space, but then if you have a quantum constraint, you have to impose that constraint to uh, extract the so-called physical states. And this extraction can be done either by projection operator or by just explicitly solving the constraint. And gravity explicit solving of the constraint is a, is a very difficult task. And one of the leading problems in, in quantum gravity. But an important thing, I mean, from the viewpoint of quantum computing is that the projection operator is non-unitary. Therefore, it cannot be associated with a quantum circuit. Okay, so this is a problem. So, in our uh, considerations, we, we try to avoid that problem, okay, and to consider only the states which already satisfy the constraint. And we restricted our, uh, our focus on a states which satisfy the, the Gauss constraint, okay. However, the Gauss constraint is the simplest one to solve, okay? Uh, by the way, we are preparing a paper right now uh, on the problem of solving a scalar constraint using uh, the quantum uh, circuits, but this is, this is a work in progress. So I'm not going to go into the detail of that. 
Uh, so basically, we we in the case we when when we consider states which are satisfying the Gauss constraint, like a spin network states, the transition amplitude uh, simplifies. That you had, I mean, the action of the projection operator on one of the states gives just a state, and this this, this simplifies everything. And then you can introduce a circuit which uh, allows you to evaluate transition amplitude between the two different states. And for this purpose, you have to introduce a unitary operators which generate the states from uh, initial state of the quantum uh, um, of the quantum computer. And based on this unitary operators, you can introduce some new operator. And having this U, U operator, you can eventually do a measurement which gives you the, the amplitude. This is actually something very straightforward. Uh, I'm going to skip this part because this is actually about the entanglement. And that would be, I think, too much to say. But let me just uh, say a few words. Namely, if you have a link between the two nodes, which are, which is uh, uh, gluing together a two tetrahedra, this is actually related with entanglement. Okay, and there is uh, there is a state which can be introduced uh, through the link. Okay, this is something extremely interesting uh, from the viewpoint of building space time with entanglement. Maybe you heard about this. This is one of the currently leading um, area of research in, in quantum gravity, namely the interface between the, the gravity and entanglement, and how entanglement actually might lead to to the gravity and this is what we are doing here is very very in the spirit i'm going to skip this uh, and um, show you some examples namely the simplest uh, amplitude that you can consider is is an amplitude in which you have a certain uh, Spin net, this is a trivial, I would say, spin network set with a one node, which is dual to, to the, uh, a single tetrahedra in which the two faces, uh, two pairs of faces are uh, glued by the entanglement, okay? So you can consider a state of this kind and then consider a transition amplitude between the this, this state and let's say one of the basis state of the intertwiner qubit. And then you can do the simulations. The quantum circuit which allows you to do that is of this form. And we did the simulations on both Melbourne and New Yorktown quantum computers and we get pretty good agreement with the theoretical predictions, okay? In our case, the two probabilities are um, 0 0.25 and 0 0.75. And as you see, the, the, the results are converging with the theoretical predictions. Then you can uh, go to the, to the dipole case. Um, and um, you can, uh, introduce the entanglement between the tetrahedras through the links. Uh, actually, there's a lot of different possibilities within this actually configuration. This is what you can take a look in more details in the paper. But the, uh, the point is that eventually, you can uh, build a quantum circuit 
uh, of this form, which is representing a transition amplitude uh, between this state representing a maximal entanglement through the links and the configurations in which there is no entanglement at all. And in that case, the, the quantum circuit is of this form. It's pretty complicated. Also, you have to keep in mind that you have U1 and V1 matrices, which have to be introduced appropriately, which might um, require a couple of uh, elementary gates to be involved. And you see, we need a quantum register with, with, with at least eight um, uh, qubits. So we can do, we, we can't uh, evaluate the circuit on the five qubit quantum computer. So the only possibility is to run it on, on the Melbourne. And we found that actually this circuit uh, can be embedded in the structure of connectivity of the Melbourne quantum computer. However, performing the simulations, we found that because of the uh, depth of the circuit, uh, which is pretty big, uh, we got very poor results. Actually, we did a lot of uh, testing, which is in the appendix of our paper. And uh, we found that uh, the, the errors accumulate so strongly that, you know, eventually we have, we got results which basically have nothing to do with the theoretical predictions, okay? So the results are highly inconclusive, okay? So uh, we can do a simulation of a single node, but already a passing to a two nodes case makes things very uh, uncertain, okay? Because of the errors and, and the, 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 the related decoherence processes. Then you can uh, also consider time evolution. This is related with the so-called spin forms. Uh, I'm not going to, to um, discuss this, but if you, if you are interested, uh, you can take a look into, into a paper, but this is actually related with, with, the, with the current challenge as well. Namely, we would like to, uh, we would like to simulate this spin network, which is this pentagram spin network, which is extremely important in loop quantum gravity because it represents a boundary of a, of a, of a space-time point, okay? So, uh, we are uh, doing analysis concerning a possibility of simulation of this, uh, this uh, spin network with the five nodes, but for this purpose, you need 20 qubits, okay? So uh, that is our current challenge to try to implement this one, okay? And I'm uh, encouraging you to, to play with this as well, if you, if you, if you are interested. So uh, let me go to, to summary and, and, and outlook. So uh, we are doing some, some, some play with, uh, with the simulating loop quantum gravity. As, as, you, as you've seen, I mean, for the moment we cannot do much actually, okay? So the, the quantum computing is not useful yet, okay? But we learn a lot about how the spin networks can be associated with this, with uh, with the quantum circuits. So this is something what is completely new. Okay, so uh, one and a half years ago, there were no quantum circuits for uh, for uh, spin network state. I mean, nobody was playing this. Nobody was exploring this. So I mean, I would say this is a good test ground for relation between the quantum information and quantum gravity. Okay, even if 
the simulations itself are not giving us much yet, okay? Uh, this is a tool to really to better understand relation between the gravity and quantum information. And concerning that the forecast for the, for the near future, I mean, uh, we can do pretty much with the emulators, you know, like with the, I mean, 40 qubits is something what is possible to simulate on supercomputers, classical supercomputers. So we can simulate 10 nodes, spin networks, this is something, okay? Concerning quantum computers, I mean, my estimate, uh, I did some more detailed uh, forecast in, in one of the papers. My, my current forecast is that we can play, we will be possible to, to it will be possible to uh, simulate roughly a 100 node system in 10 years, okay? But this is something, this is already something, okay? So this is a long-term project, okay? We, there is no, uh, you know, super uh, results that we expect in, in the coming uh, two, three years, okay? We, we have to be patient, okay, concerning the, um, the, 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 the interesting results. And as, as I mentioned, I mean, so far, we've been mostly concerning that kinematical sector, so without imposing constraints or with, with imposing the Gauss constraint only. But the, really the problem in quantum gravity, not only in, in, um, in um, loop quantum gravity, but also in the related approaches, is solving constraint. Um, the Hamiltonian constraint and the vector constraint. And uh, actually this is something what we are working on currently with a PhD student of mine, Grzegorz, using variational quantum eigen solver. But this is in progress, so uh, um, stay tuned. And um, I think we will put the paper on the archive within two months. Um, actually, this, this approach is also a, 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 a way to explore relation with tensor networks. I don't know if you heard about tensor networks approach to, uh, to describe uh, complex uh, quantum systems. This is something which is explored a lot currently. And uh, I had a slide on that, but uh, I skipped that slide uh, because of the lack of time. But this is also interesting uh, thing that we are currently exploring, also in the context of the um, this duality between the gravity and the entanglement. We are also currently working on the quantum simulations for cosmology, so uh, symmetry reduced configurations. Uh, one of the interesting thing is is study of uh, entanglement entropy. And this is something what we can already do for kinematical configurations. This is important because uh, in gravity, we are looking for uh, states for which the entanglement entropies uh, scales with the area of the, of the, of the, uh, of the volume enclosed by a certain uh, area. Uh, there is a, uh, pretty much of a theoretical motivation for this kind of scaling in, in, in gravity and, and semi-classical considerations like black hole entropy. I didn't mention that, but uh, actually in my first slide, I, I've shown the D-wave quantum computer, which is, uh, which, which is not a universal quantum computer, but, but a quantum annular. And actually there's, there are prospects concerning application of annulars. Actually, I, I wrote the first paper in this direction uh, in early 2018 on that. And also there has been uh, recently a very nice paper concerning uh, uh, optical circuits, optical processors uh, to simulate spin network uh, states. Um, and um, there's quite a lot of advantages for optical quantum processors um, and maybe eventually, actually, the, the, the processors, the optical ones, will be the way to, 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 to simulate um, the, the, the spin network state. I mean, 
I, I want to emphasize that this is something very new. Okay, so this is a, a domain which is just uh, we are just creating this, and uh, for the moment there are basically only two groups, uh, uh, namely my one and the group. Uh, um, of Chinese and some Americans who, who, who wrote that paper and one more paper, okay? So there's basically, the domain is like a, um, six papers in total, okay? So this is something, we, we, we are building this from scratch, basically. And uh, we see a lot of potential to, to, to push this forward. So I think that's all, thank you. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Jakub, for a very interesting uh, lecture and congratulations on uh, such a good results and publications. Uh, all right, I see that there are questions. Uh, Teril, do you want to ask? It's not a question, it was a cap, uh, clap, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> good. Um, so, does anyone want to ask a question to Jakub? I actually I have two questions, uh, so I'm not an expert in um, quantum gravity and simulating uh, quantum gravity. So it's uh, a totally new area for me, but it, it sounds and it looks very interesting. Uh, but I was also uh, very curious about the results which you presented, which are uh, which may uh, seem to be uh, more general, I guess. Uh, I mean, uh, you compare the results of experiments on those two. Uh, quantum computers, Yorktown and Melbourne, right? And there were uh, different results. And I was curious, what was what was the reason? Because uh, I know that there were different topologies and different number of neurons. Uh, so was the fidelity, different fidelity a result of uh, just a different uh, level of noise? Uh, or um, because the, the, the better result, better fidelity was achieved for this uh, smaller uh, quantum processor right Yorktown with five qubits so can you uh, can you explain do you know how to explain the difference yeah so uh, take a look at the topology so here here we have a uh, uh, Yorktown the, the the first actually publicly available um, quantum uh, computer by IBM uh, which is uh, constantly improved and you see that, uh, for instance, uh, the single qubit U2 error rate is at the level of 10 to the minus four, okay? Or approaching 10 to the minus three. So this is 1000, okay? So this is, this is already very small, okay? Which was not the case um, a couple of years ago, which was much bigger at the, at the, uh, of the order of, uh, 10 to the minus three. I mean, there is a there is a significant Im improvement concerning the 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 single qubit error and also uh, two qubit error. Okay, by C note, you see that I mean for Melbourne, this uh, these errors are uh, are bigger. Okay, uh, there is basically a, a an order of magnitude difference for a certain certain uh, qubits. In our simulation, we try to use the best qubits, okay, with the with the uh, the smallest uh, uh, errors. Of course, if you have a higher number of qubits, uh, it's uh, you, you have a bigger system, and it's uh, it's it's more difficult uh, to deal with the noise, okay, to control the noise for a, for a, for a more complicated, more um extensive um system okay so therefore i mean this is natural consequence of the size of the system okay and another thing um that the, the reason is uh that that this five qubit quantum computer has been i mean uh improved for a longer time okay so there are better um i mean i actually the, the hardware is better understood than, than, than this one, okay? And uh, eventually you have this, uh, this, um, this difference in the, in the fidelities, which is at the end, I mean, not 
such a big, I mean, 5%, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, however, um, this is for, let me, this is for, this is for a system with four qubits involved actually in the quantum simulations. Uh, with that, um, with that, um, uh, a couple of tests, as I mentioned, I mean, they can be found in, in appendix our last paper that, I mean, even if you don't do anything on the, on the Melbourne, uh, quantum computer, I mean, the errors are at the end pretty, pretty significant. Okay. Uh, except you restrict your simulation to, uh, to let's say to four, okay? But if you already involve eight qubits, it really spoil the, the simulations. Another thing is that, you know, you have a given a coherence time, okay? Which is given by these two uh, time scales. And uh, deeper the, the, the circuit is, okay? Um, the more coherence, coherence time you need, okay? We didn't analyze in details, I mean, uh, how, uh, how much time really, because this, the, all, not all this knowledge is, uh, all these numbers uh, can be extracted from simulations, okay? But um, our guess is that, I mean, this time, which is used for 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 this kind of circuit of this depth, okay, is uh, is already bigger than the um, time scale, the the co coherence time scale for for the processor, okay. Therefore, you cannot eventually trust your results uh, if this kind of circuit is is under considerations. Mm -hmm. I don't know if if this explains uh, this answers to it. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, it's fine. I was I was just curious uh, whether the because now now uh, the noise is a problem, right? So we we want to just we have to deal with it somehow. Uh, I I was also curious whether uh, the noise uh, can be an advantage uh, anyhow, right? Because as you said, we can we can uh, easily simulate. Uh, such a relatively small um, quantum systems on a classical quantum computer. Um, so, of course, uh, if you want to simulate larger system, then uh, right now we'll not be able to just simulate more than uh, 40 qubits, as you as you said. But one one of the differences uh, also is maybe not not only the possibility that um, the number of qubits that we can simulate. Uh, but but also the the noise. So in general, I understand that here in this problem, the noise uh, the noise is a is an issue, and we have to deal with it somehow. Uh, but can you imagine some applications of uh, real, not simulated, but real quantum computers uh, in this area in quantum gravity, uh, where uh, the noise or having a noise might be an advantage? So then, um, the real quantum computers may have some advantage comparing to simulators of quantum computers because the, there are such uh, ideas as uh, uh, NISQ which uh, approaches which uh, try to just uh, uh, employ the, the power of uh, um, uh, contemporary quantum computers which are which are noisy but in some cases the noise uh, may not necessarily be in a disadvantage because it also introduced some randomness which we cannot control in general but I was I was just curious because that's a totally new area, and uh, I was just thinking whether whether having a noise might be an advantage here somehow. I mean, it it, it might be. I mean, from the viewpoint of um, con concerning, let, let's say that you have a certain uh, uh, subsystem, okay, composed of a, of a couple of uh, let's say. Uh, atoms of space, okay? And then what you might be interested in is what's happening with this, uh, with this quantum system uh, if the system is in contact with environment and you don't know, uh, basically, you, you know nothing about the, the properties of the, of the environment, okay? 
And uh, this is actually the, a process which might be associated with the emergence of the semi-classical configurations, okay? And the so-called uh, pointer states. I mean, the, in the sense that uh, the system, the quantum system in, uh, in contact with the thermal bath, okay, or environment, might evolve towards a certain semi-classical configurations, okay, which are described eventually by uh, classical mechanics, not quantum mechanics, okay? So, I mean, from that perspective, you may think about applicability of the, of the noise, okay, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, a nightmare from the viewpoint of uh, what we would like to get here, okay? But you may indeed uh, consider situations in which you can learn something about the evolution of the quantum states in the presence of interaction with environment, okay? Which is usually, uh, you know, described by uh, a Lindblad e e equation, okay? Um, which uh, describes the evolution of the density matrix in the presence of uh, a certain dissipative uh, um, effects, okay? Here you can try to simulate this uh, effects. However, you don't have a control over what kind of noise you have. I mean, it's, it's actually determined by the property of your, of your hardware, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jakub. Any more questions to Jakub? I have actually I have one one more which already uh, discussed just before before the webinar, but I guess that uh, more people might be interested because here we uh, uh, here we are simulating uh, we are simulating um, a, a quant a quantum uh, process quantum phenomenon uh, using quantum comp computer. Uh, but uh, I guess that some people might be, and uh, as you said, it's a it's a basic research, very interesting. But uh, there might be also some potentially applications of quantum computers in general. And now the question is whether uh, such quantum simulations might be uh, somehow applied to simulating classical phenomena as well, not only quantum phenomena, but 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 classical. If you if you heard, have you heard about such uh, applications or um, can you imagine that there, there, there might be such applications? Yeah, uh, so, so there's a couple of possibilities. I mean, if you have, I mean, every, every classical system, okay, is, uh, is, is, is a certain uh, limit of a quantum system, okay? And uh, the, the, the most classical uh, quantum systems uh, are, described by the so-called coherent states, okay? So, so one possibility to, to go towards actually the classical description is, is to, to play with the coherent states, okay? Which uh, interpolate between the quantum mechanical system and the classical system. And actually here in quantum gravity, this is one of the uh, uh, paths that we would like to explore because we would like to understand how the classical space time or classical space emerge out of the very you know fuzzy quantum um, uh, configuration okay so so the one thing one possibility is to consider the, the coherent states okay and you can I don't know uh, implement let's say the harmonic oscillator which in the in case of the um, coherent state describes uh, a wave packet oscillating in the potential well for instance okay this is one thing another thing is that if you think about the classical systems okay and the simulation of the classical systems uh, you usually consider it in terms of certain uh, discretizations, okay? Let's say that uh, you, you want to simulate, um, let's say, the hydrodynamics, okay? You, you take the Navier-Stokes equation and you discretize this 
partial differential equation and apply uh, classical algorithms to uh, to um, uh, to solve the equations, okay? And some some in certain problems, this discretized equations that you get from the classical system, okay, are a certain systems of equations, okay? Like uh, in a in a special cases, uh, just linear equations, okay? And we know that there are quantum algorithms which uh, do pretty well, at least in theory with uh, solving the systems of equations, okay? So, I mean, from this perspective, the quantum algorithm might, uh, might be useful in the classical simulations, okay? At the level of solving equations, okay? I mean, the differential equations which uh, emerge from the discretization of uh, of, uh, uh, let's say, partial differential equations, okay? Okay, cool. Another possibility, of course, is in statistical mechanics, okay? Uh, and uh, here, um, th there is a pretty broad uh, possibility concerning um, utility of uh, annealers, quantum annealers, like uh, like a D wave. Okay, what you do in a D wave is that you are looking for a certain uh, um, certain configuration of a classical spin system. Okay, you 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 treat the the, the your readout is classical. Okay, of course there is a quantum process involved which might speed up your uh, your search process. Okay. And this is where, you know, the, the quantum mechanics enters, okay? And this is where the quantum mechanics uh, can be useful, okay? But the problem itself is classical. It's a classical search for, it's a, it's a classical problem of the configurations, let's say, for the Ising uh, spin system or any other classical problem, which is, uh, um, which is um, uh, related to the problem of surging of the ground state of a given um, spin configuration, which is annealed, okay, in the in the adiabatic quantum uh, computer. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any more questions to Jakub? I had one question, but can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Yes, go on. All right. Hey, uh, I'm just like an undergrad student, but of the things that you talked about, there is a thing that I want to ask you. In your last slide, you said these nodes, like in 10 years, we will be able to simulate up to 100 nodes. So the question is, after like some size increasing, the quantum effects like seem to decay and we pass to this classical physical realm. So after how many nodes do we pass to like classical theory of uh, gravitation? And so like the reason I'm asking is this, after what like node prediction and simulation will we be able to actually physically test the things that this models, the quantum gravity models predict and we do the experiment? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so I mean, that 100 nodes is not much, okay, to be honest, okay? I mean, we would like to have an access to the hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of, of nodes to, to, to really, you know, the capture uh, um, classical properties of, of space or space-time. 100 nodes is still something, I would say, um, it, it's a kind of intermediate uh, configuration. I, I call it mesoscopic, okay? Because it, it's, it's neither microscopic when we consider, let's say, a couple of nodes or macroscopic in, in, which, in which we have, the, let's say, the hundreds of thousands of nodes. This is a mesoscopic configuration, but we uh, uh, expect that 
already, you know, uh, playing with this, this sort of mesoscopic systems, we can start to see certain collective properties, okay? For instance, if you have, uh, let's say, that, uh, a classical Ising model, um, and you have a lattice uh, 10 by 10, so this is uh, 100 uh, Ising spins in total, okay? This is a system that you can simulate easily. I mean, classically, you can easily simulate it on your smartphone. But already with the 100 of nodes, you can um, observe um, the phase transitions, okay? And um, symmetry breaking in, um, in, the, in the Ising model, okay? So you already can see a certain um, properties, okay, which are uh, preserved at the much bigger scales, okay? We don't know whether that will be so simple in gravity, okay? It might not, okay? But you know that the 10 years time frame is something, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a time frame in which, you know, we will not lose our enthusiasm in, in following this path, okay? We would like to get something in, in 10 years. I mean, something which will be uh, really useful and something which will be impossible to uh, obtain using any other uh, available methods at that time, okay? I don't know if it answers your, your, your question. It did, it gave me a nice idea, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, any more questions to Jakub? Maybe I have just, just one question at, at the end. Uh, can you go to your last slide with this co Cosmos Lab, right? Can you, can you tell yeah. Quantum Cosmos Lab, can you tell our audience uh, what it is exactly? So the, 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 the Quantum Cosmos Lab is, is my group at the Aguilar University. And um, I would say we have six leading uh, research domains currently. Uh, so as I mentioned, Actually, at the very beginning, we are mostly uh, quantum gravity and researchers and theoretical physicists uh, with the inclination towards uh, quantum information. So, uh, of course, I'm, I'm encouraging you to visit our website. Here's the, the, the address. So, uh, you're welcome to, 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 to visit our website and to, to, to learn more about what we are doing. Basically, um, uh, our, I mean, currently leading research directions are this one that we were talking about today. I mean, the quantum simulations of quantum gravity. This is also actually uh, a part of the bigger um, initiative uh, quantum information structure of space-time ground that we are currently uh, conducting, um, and which has been supported from Templeton uh, Foundation from US. Uh, we are we we have a lead, we have a research program um, related to the compact phase space. Uh, which is founded from Polish uh, National Research Center. This is also uh, a, a pretty broad program under development currently since uh, some like five years. We did a lot of phenomenology of quantum gravity, including formation of the primary gravitational waves in the early universe. But we are also interested in uh, applications of quantum and gravity uh, in technology like, uh, for instance, uh, quantum space communication using satellites and how gravitational effects affect uh, capacity of quantum channels uh, for secure quantum communication using satellites. Actually, this is, a, this is something what is happening currently. The first satellites are conducting this uh, kind of uh, 
quantum communication. So we are we are very uh, interested in uh, in in this domain. Also, uh, we are uh, since uh, since some time doing more and more uh, quantum uh, quantum um, cryptography and related stuff. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I think that we can finish the meeting if there are no uh, questions. Uh, I will just uh, show you two last slides. So, uh, Jakub, now I will just share my screen. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I hope that you can see my screen now. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to tell you that the next meeting of our group will be in two weeks from now. Piotr Biskupski uh, from I IBM will tell about Kiss Kid Pools. Uh, and uh, of course, let's stay in touch uh, on our Facebook group um, mailing list. Uh, the video recording from this meeting will be also available soon on, on YouTube channel, hopefully. Uh, so just let's stay in touch. And uh, yeah, thank you once again for joining uh, this webinar. Thanks, Jakub, once again for a really great lecture. Uh, and uh, I hope to uh, see and hear everyone uh, once again in two weeks uh, from now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pavel. Thank, thanks all the participants.